Welcome to The Radical Guide. I'm Jason, and today we're sitting down with environmental activist Jerry Palmer. Welcome, Jerry, and thanks for making the time to be in this conversation with us. Um, just so everyone knows, this is the first time that I've met and spoke with Jerry, and I would like to use this time just to really get to know you, what you're up to, um, and and learn more about you and your work and your environmental activism. So let's start to what I know, and then we'll go from there. So what okay. I know is Jerry's joining us from Mississippi. He wrote this amazing book called Buttons, Bolt Cutters, and Barricades about the Texas anti-nuke actions that happened in the late 70s through the early 80s. This book shares firsthand stories of those who took a wide range of action to stop parts of the nuclear industry. Welcome, Jerry. It's great to have you here. Well, thank you for having me. Look forward to this. Before we jump into kind of the details of the books and, and your history of environmental activism, can you tell us a little bit about the book, the high level, why you wrote it, um, and your role within the stories of the book? Okay, yeah. Uh, I'd always wanted to write something that kind of mattered or meant something to, to people, and I fell into this part of it by... I was lucky enough on the first couple of actions that we did, my photo was on the front page of several of the uh, newspapers in the Dallas Fort Worth area, just by happenstance. <laughs> and, you know, and it wasn't because I was photogenic or anything. It was just the way that, you know, there were so many photographers there snapping all these pictures. And so the day after an action, there would be my picture. And I'm thinking, well, you know, maybe I should keep these and use them later, which is kind of what it's turned out to be. And the next thing I know, I've gotten, uh, you know, quite a collection of paraffin, you know, propaganda and, and, you know, images and stuff like that. So it was not like it went out, to, you know, a planned, I'm going to write a book about this. <laughs> but after a while, I started thinking, well, that might be a pretty good thing because we're always taking notes at the affinity group meetings or so, stuff like that. And so it, one thing led to another. So you, you you compiled all these these photos and the, um, details about the action, and you you made a book about it. So what's the narrative of the book for people who who may be interested? I wanted to make sure the story was told because it was quite an adventure from day one. Actually, the first rally I went to. The next day, we had a big uh, training session, you know, nonviolent training session, because that was really stressed. If you're going to participate in this action, you will go through this nonviolent training session. There will be no, you could come be a supporter and not have to go through the training. But to be a participant, to get arrested, this is what you needed to do. And so it, uh, the, the next week is when the action was planned. So it was a it was a bit of a snowball, but at the same time, I could feel a camaraderie with the people that were there. They were serious about wanting to do something about actually just straight out stopping the Comanche Peak nuke south of Dallas in Glen Rose, Texas. And as you find we, in the educational part of the training class, they would tell us this is what has already happened. They've already gone through the petitions, the regular sign carrying protests, basically lawsuits, and this thing is still going forward. And there was a pending lawsuit that actually didn't get settled till sometime in the late 80s, right before the nuke opened up. So it was, it was, uh, like I said, it was quite an adventure putting all this together. I mean, you know, I know that's kind of vague, but that's just the way it started <laughs> out. I mean, and the one thing I had was the old Instamatic cameras that you could take like 30 photos with. And I carried one of those with me just about all the time and used it, you know. I, and it was amazing the quality of those photos. And that really helped. So And so I was able, in the book, actually, to use a large number of my own photos. Yeah. They, and, I, you know. Just looking at ahead. the book, there's there's just so many wonderful photos and, and historical um, 
archive of of all of these movements and and um, actions that that happened during this time. And before we get into that, I, I'm just really curious of like, you know, you talked about you went to trainings of of civil disobedience and nonviolent direct action. Let's let's back up a little bit. What 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 radicalized you in and wanting to take on this action and get involved with this? What what spoke to you and what did you see that made you want to actually step into those those high stress and high you know political arena? Yeah, that that you have to put your boots on to get a, a good answer to that because that it goes way back to being a kid in Mississippi, growing up in the in the. Uh, Actually, the late 50s, early 60s, with all the uh, basically the civil rights movement happening right here around me and only hearing bits and pieces of it on the news. And then also hearing from my folks talking about what was going on in town because we live out in the country a little bit. And it just I was always amazed at pe the actions people were taking to change their world if they weren't ha you know in that in that time frame that direct action it was going on and listening to people like dr king's you know give speeches on on tv that had a big influence on me but also things like my dad worked at a company then they had a little independent union and they went on strike in the early 60s and stayed on strike for like six weeks and got a nickel raise out of the whole thing. But the, the solidarity that I saw him show with his brothers on the picket line, you know, not getting paid, but going over there, walking the picket line, that made a lasting impression on me. I mean, as a youngster. And... And I just always kind of wanted to be part of something like that that made a difference for, for a pot, you know, you know, for something good. And, you know, back then, pollution wasn't that big a deal that, you know, I knew of. Uh, the first and I, the first people I ever saw, the first activists I ever knew were the 12, 13 and 14 year old kids that came to our school to help stop segregation. I didn't see these kids' parents, they, their parents didn't bring them to school in the car and drop them off. These kids had gotten on the school bus and came to our school and it was amazing the how strong they were just mentally putting up with the verbal abuse, mm -hmm. harassment, and you know, it, it just amazed me and I thought, you know, these, these, there's a lot of good that can be done that's not being done, yeah. if that makes sense at all. Yeah, totally, totally does. And, and go ahead. No, 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 feel free. Well, I was, you know, and apparently, I mean, looking back on it, uh, I'm not sure who help train these people, but their parents had to have been trained in nonviolent technique, you know, tactics, either through the, you know, Southern Christian Leadership Conference or whoever, you know, and uh, it was just amazing how, how strong these kids were. It, it, that just uh, stuck with me. Yeah. And then radicalizing being like, you know, the watching and the body count from Southeast Asia being shown on TV, the nightly news every night, five o'clock, you know, this nightly news and there it was, killed or wounded, US, North Vietnamese, South Vietnamese, Viet Cong. It was just like a, you know, it's like a scorecard similar to what has been going on now with the COVID thing, but different, but similar. And so, Little things like that add up. And, you know, and, and being being in Mississippi again in the segregation of the of the whole state in the sense that 
us just go ahead and say us Anglos or white people went about our world and went about doing what we, we did. And there was not, not a whole lot of thought put to that in my mind, being as a child. And then realizing that, okay, on Saturdays, that's a different, the, it's like a page is turned. The town, the, the people of color, black folks get to come to town on, on, on Saturdays. And that was just kind of strange. It's like, what's, what do you mean? Well, that's when they get to do that. You know, that's, that didn't seem right. You know, tease that out a little bit. So just for, um, can you kind of paint that picture? What does that mean that they get to come to town on Saturday? Well, it, it did it looking back at it, they weren't encouraged to come spend money or come into town and participate in, 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 in life there. Uh, and I don't know if there were stores out in the in the county. Well, actually, I do know there were small grocery stores, like what we would call convenience stores now, but they were, you know, uh, owned by somebody uh, in in the community there, and th they could come in after or come in the back and get their supplies and stuff like that, and get a credit account or something like that. But they just weren't. I'm not sure it weren't allowed to come into town or they just discouraged from doing it. Yeah. And it was like, it was like everybody, the couple of times that we'd go into town on Saturdays, you could see, I mean, it was like a near, nearly like a festival with all these folks, you know, it's like, okay, we get out, we got, you know, we can do whatever we want in town kind of thing. You know? And you may want to cut that kind of stuff. I don't know. I'm just, it's just way yeah. it seemed to me. Yeah, no, no, I, I appreciate you sharing it because I, I just kind of wanted to paint the picture because what's showing up and, and what I like about your, your book and, and, and the stories that it shared in there and us, and one of the reasons why I, I wanted to talk to you from a radical guide is because just how the sixties impacted you and, and uh, opened your eyes to that the current state of the world is not the one that you wanted or, 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 or was right. Um, I think what you, you're highlighting the book in the 19, you know, the late seventies and, and early eighties and the actions and what's happening there. I think um, my generation, you know, like I, I, we said all, before hitting record, I was five years old on the first action that was um, mentioned in the book. Um and I think there's just really something that having this conversation and us being connected connects us to a part of history that we can learn for, from and see this thread that's being pulled throughout history that is that is rooted and grounded in justice. Um, right. And so you sharing that story of, of your connection of how how you were radicalized, you know, seeing, you know, seeing the union, seeing the strike, seeing the political climate. Um, I, th I think it's really important. That's that's the thread that's being pulled throughout history. Even today, we're just expressing, we may be expressing it in this assumption, we may be expressing it differently. Um, but I think looking at your book and hearing your stories, I think we can learn a lot from it. So one, thank you for sharing, sharing that story. Oh yeah. And, and the, the other thing, just a little fast forward on, on that, by the time we got, you know, after the schools were integrated for a while, things kind of settled down, you know, the hotheads got used to what's going on or they phased out, they quit school, they graduated, whatever. And, uh, and then that was about the time the, the anti-war movement across the country and world was really strong but we didn't see any of that in Mississippi, not that I can remember at all. And then all of a sudden, the killings at Jackson State happened. I'm talking about 10 miles away. And everybody in my little town is like, oh, we got to stay away from Jackson. It's, you know, it's really bad over there. Well, it was really bad because the National Guard and the Jackson City Police went into Jackson State campus and shot these kids mm. that really brought it to it like this is not right you know it was 11 days after kent state and so okay this 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 kind of stuff goes on all over and can happen here in mississippi with us you know so 
that that was uh that was interesting time yeah so we 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 have kind of the political climate of what what you grew up with in and what you witnessed. So let's let's move to 1979 and one of the okay. the, the first um, stories in the book um, or features in the books is the occupation of 1979. Before we get into um, the details of how you organized, how you built coalitions, how all that, can you can you let us like give us some insight of what um, the political climate, what in, in, in one in Texas and two, just in, in the anti nuke movement altogether. Right. Well, first of all, I came at this through, I mean, literally the back door. I was not really what you would call an organizer. I came in as a, you know, a volunteer straight mm-hmm. up, but in Texas at the time, there were some, the powers that be, if you will, there were some progressive minded people out there. You know, you had uh, like the firebrand uh, journalist Molly Ivins stirring up stuff all the time. A populist radio host, John Henry Falk, who had was blacklisted in the McCarthy year and actually sued and won his case and helped bring that era to an end. And but at the same time, you had. uh the big oil companies and stuff are ripping and snorting and going, you know, I mean, mm-hmm. and I think it was June the 3rd, 79 is when the Istock one oil blow uh, rig blew up or messed up in Campeche Bay in Mexico. And that was one of the largest oil spills. It is still one of the oil, largest oil spills ever. The only di- the difference in it and the deep horizon that just happened, you know, in a recent memory is Campeche was in shallow water with deep, deep water horizon is very deep water. So, uh, same story, same greed, same, <laughs> same story, same greed, let it burn itself out, you know, and there's still, from what I've heard, there's still evidence of, you know, that oil on the shores in that area. So, uh, the political climate, I mean, it was at that age being my midst, you know, early 20s mid 20s and stuff you know you're a little idealistic about stuff you think you know you're hoping that, that you can make a difference and there will be differences made and, and yes there were you know there's you know you had uh cooperatives uh going on health food stores popping up you know um so that how kind do, of stuff how, how do you see like cooperatives worker cooperatives and and health food stores playing a role in cr- helping create this this new political environment um, well it, it was more like a, a gathering place or you know i guess the biggest thing i noticed was a huge bulletin board people would stick flyers up on it your little cards you know notes to someone you know way before social media you know you could just you know you could hang out there talk to the people they were down to earth you know it's like well what is organic gardening, you know, and it was search for knowledge. If you've seen about this stuff, you want to know about it and you find out, it. oh, it's pretty simple stuff. This is what my grandparents were doing already. They didn't call it organic. They just didn't have, (laughs) you know, they just didn't apply all the chemicals and stuff that were just all of a sudden were readily available and supposed to feed the world type stuff, you know? Yeah. And the, uh, I, I was, working as a landscape laborer on crews working for a big landscape company and 90 percent of our clients were very well to do people so i got to see and and occasionally talk to those people and find out what they were you know what they were up to because these landscape jobs that we would do would last a week two weeks three weeks a month so you get to know people and know their dogs, their kids, you know, and I know that kind of goes off the track of what you're talking about, but at least, you know, I was hanging out with people that were more working class, and then I'm being able to go work for these people that are really, you know, are the wealthy upper crust bots, you know, mm-hmm. so I'm kind of in the middle there. Yeah, and so 
having having those uh, they like the health food stores and the worker co-ops uh, obviously brought a different um world view to how we function and co cooperate together you know like having a worker co-op is definitely a challenge to the capitalist model of hierarchical corporate corporate um uh operations so right. when there was like a you know the bulletin board people would come in and saying hey we're doing a training uh you would see stuff like that or it's just just that circle it, it, the, well no that was pretty much what it was I, and, yeah. and after talking to people now that's how they found out about a particular action mm -hmm. like one of the uh the women that really contributed to the book and who is now a lawyer in denver she uh she found out about the action that we were going to Washington, D.C. to shut, you know, the title of it was shut down the Pentagon, I believe, or, you know, march on D.C. That's mm -hmm. how she found out about it. it was a simple flyer. And it's how I, you know, I saw the, uh, you know, June 2nd rally and at Tarantula Ranch in Glen Rose, Texas, a no nukes rally. And so I just drive down there and that's how. I, I got involved literally is just showing up and then just start talking to people. Cause you can tell you're all there for the same reason. They're like-minded folks. And you just kind of, you know, let it grow. It's not like I started out a member of a co-op yeah. or, a, you know, a group like that. It just kind of grew into affinity group connections and us starting our own garden and becoming friends and becoming more active common cause if you will yeah. so and I'll, I'll go ahead no i was, I was just going to say so you found a flyer you drove out to a protest you started making connections um deep connections not just not just, what it sounds like is they're not just transactional it's like we're here and we're going to talk about them it was actually you know going deeper making deeper connections um so uh, when you start organizing and you start getting deeper into, into uh, these anti-nuke um, protests and, and occupations and civil disobedience, what did the, how did you organize and what did the support within that community, the kind of the organizing community that it looked like? It was basically working class people that had enough, they took the time to come to a meeting and to find out if this is what I want to be involved in or, or not. And, you know, once you came, the first, the first training, nonviolent training class I went to, there was probably about 15, 20 people there. They were, the trainers were, there were two or three, maybe four people that knew each other. Everybody else were, is, were perfect strangers. And the the trainers just laid out this is this is the agenda this is what we're going to do, and so you build trust through these different methods of the training and role playing, discussion, hitting on consensus decision making, breaking that down into quick decision making, and it was like okay these this is this is good stuff here you know we might have a chance to make a difference. So would it be safe to say that you you didn't consider yourself a, an activist and, and a lot of the people who didn't know each other didn't consider themselves activists? They just saw a need to show up and then yes. from there, that's how it happened? Yes, it was basically grassroots citizen organizing, you know, uh, and, you know, a common cause that, you know, we need to stop, you know, we need to do what we can to stop this nuclear plant from being constructed. And the logistics of how we were going to do it would put out that this action has been, it has been planned on to do on June the 10th, the authorities being the owners of the property, the people that are building the nuclear plant, the Texas Rangers who are the state police, the local sheriff, bless his heart, that he knew about it. So it was, that's what we called it, a greased action. And all of a sudden we became, we were activists because 
we signed up. We have, you know, it's just like in the book there. I have a copy of the release form that you check these, this, this, this. I will, you know, I will not break, you know, I will not uh, run. I will not be threatening. I will not curse anybody. You just all this general, I'll be a good person during this act, you know, no drugs, no alcohol, uh, and sign your name on it. Mm -hmm. And so the authorities knew or they felt that we would not be a threat. And that was the nonviolence part of it, which was so important and showing that we're not a threat to them physically. And I, 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 that is really what helped us go forward with these different actions in my mind. Yeah. Did you, you know, you mentioned earlier kind of in, in, in your personal story of listening to MLK on the TV and then seeing um, what was happening in the civil rights movement and, and hindsight, knowing the history of like SNCC um, and their, how how they trained uh, with MLK and um, James Lawson in terms of nonviolent civil disobedience and, you know, the counter sit-ins and stuff. Did you, was there any connection of understanding that y'all were using a similar model? Uh, did you feel connected to that, that movement in this, or was this, um, just really focused on, on, on that training that may have no, may or not I, been pulled from that? No, I, no, I think you're right. There was a connection, especially, and it flowed out from their trainers because they were, they knew or were trained by people that had gone through the civil rights movement, also the anti-war movement to a certain degree. And then there was also always talk about Gandhi and the things that he did, you know, which was a long way, India is a long way from Texas, but still the whole philosophy of nonviolence, putting your body on the line and stuff. But the other thing, there's no way I can compare what those people in the civil rights what they did and what the abuse and violence that they withstood to what we did. I mean, theirs was so much greater. And, but at the same time, there was that connection. And, and you know, and it made it, and myself co coming from Mississippi and seeing, being closer to that, it really brought it home that yes, I, I get a glimpse of what they went through, mm -hmm. you know, but I, I would never like, I, I really don't, you know, I, I can't compare it. You know, it's like there's, there's was a, so much stronger and harder battle and it's still going on. And the same thing, but, but at the same time, the, the pollution issues and the environmental crisis that we're going through now is still going on also. Yeah. And, you know, so if, if that helps at all, as far as clarifying that. Yeah, you know, I'm totally clarifying. And just just the sake, the the source of the question is just like, um, again, that common thread of how we learn from the movements before us. Um, yes. It may not be the same struggle in the same degree, um, but as, as long as we are part of our knowing our history and part of that and we're pulling those threads of liberation forward. The trainings um, is what connects us. It may not be, you know, um, the exact issue, but the trainings and and the the quest and struggle towards the liberation. I think well, is, right, and 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 learning that there's you know so many different ways to have direct action. I mean, you know, it's just your your imagination. It's up to you what 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 you can come up with. To yeah. get whatever your you know your platform is or what you know, absolutely. Like in social environmental issues are uh, still need to be addressed, and you know there's protests now going on here in the South, like in Memphis in, in, on the uh, Bahia pipeline that you're trying to put right over the top of the aquifer. You know in New Orleans, there's another pipeline they're trying to put through. Oh, you know and in Dallas, you know, the pollution issues with the power, I mean, the shingle mountain, uh, the cement plants, you know, the air pollution in Dallas is nearly as bad now as it was back in the day, if you will. 
Yeah. I hate using that phrase, but that's basically what it was. But, you know, it, it was pretty bad back then, the air pollution. So. Yeah. It, cont- it definitely continues. Um, so going, kind of pulling that thread that you and, uh, and others did may or may not have been activists stepping into us, but they went through trainings um, and found themselves saying, we're doing this. And so I think what you pointed at too in the story is like the importance of having a wide coalition of folks. Yes. Um, you know, you just spoke about the working class. You spoke about just, aver- you know, everyday people who didn't think of themselves of activists. So with that, with that framing and that thinking of, of these people stepping into it, I imagine, you know, that there were high moments of stress in occupying the sites, doing um, blockades, doing this. What was the internal support structure like and how did you take care of each other? Because I know you mentioned in the book about the the trial of the 48. Um, So that's like people are now having to go to court. They've been arrested. There's, you know, there's what, what is the internal support structure look like? And, can you talk about okay well good question we started out we had legal representation from a lawyer in dallas and then we also and and uh there was also a young lawyer from uh north carolina lewis pitts who is now retired so they we had that. We had the legal defense. We had the nonviolent training. I mean, that and and the commitment that we knew that the authorities weren't going to, you know, they shouldn't be violent towards us. And so the ones of us that committed to being arrested, we had others around us, friends that newly made friends that did not really feel like they wanted to commit to being, you know, going to jail or having to pay a fine or what, but they could they could support. They're just basically a support group. They could bring, you know, water. They could have a first aid, you know, they could uh, be peacekeepers, kind of just watching out for troublemakers on the edge. Uh, They could make banners, you know, they, you know, make flags or, uh, and we built that kind of trust and support by in the meetings that we had, even though there was only a few before the first action, of like, okay, we're going to need something to get over this barbed wire fence. We're not going to cut the fence. <laughs> They're not going to open the gate for us. So we had carpenters, you know, people volunteered carpenters that uh, will build a style or a ladder to go over that. And so that right there, you know, builds trust. You working with somebody doing that. And uh, I believe the first action, there were 48 of us that were arrested and we probably had a hundred support group, Nice, you know, and, and like I said, there were, there were, uh, uh, folks there with kids, there were older people there. And, uh, so you just built on that trust. And, and the other thing that always gave, I felt that gave us a bit of an umbrella was the contact with the local media your mainstream media. I could, looking back on it, that was probably one of the most positive things that when they came to cover a story, it was fairly unbiased, open. This is what happened. Not trying to say, you know, put us in a corner or something like that. Mm -hmm. That helped build support in the community because that was really one of the main things that we were after is keep these, keep this issue in front of the public. Let them say, hey, we need to stop this because it's costing too much. Because, you know, never mind the pollution issue of the whole nuclear cycle from mining to processing to transporting it to the nuclear power or via nuclear missiles or whatever it it branches off. It's uh, it's costing too much. And so. it, it, you know, it, it was amazing how, uh, how, how, how much the people really supported us in a sense, but really didn't, you know, mass numbers of people wouldn't, didn't want to come out and, and, and protest just because, you know, 
whatever they perceived protesters were, you know. Yeah. But, it, it, it sounded like that y'all really took put attention behind making sure that everybody felt that they had a role to play and they got to choose that role instead of being kind of pushed upon them that you actually held, held the community in that, in that way. Um, that's what it, it sounds like, you know, at least in the way you describe it. And then you said that there wasn't very many people who were wanted to do the protest. Um, did you find that to be a barrier or because, or did you find that actually to, to be okay since you had so many people who were already supporting the, 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 the actions and helping push that narrative forward. Um, well, I think it was a little of both because the second, you know, we did the first protest in June and then started planning the next one as we were starting to get ready for the trials of the 48, they tried the first trial where they tried us as a group all together. And the really the great thing was there was a f four to two for acquittal. We knew we crossed that fence and we trespassed. But the issue of why we did that resonated with the local community. And it really was like uh, we couldn't have asked for a better result, <laughs> you know, because, hey, and, and it, that, it, it, it's hard to describe how good we felt about that. It's like we, it, it was definitely a victory. It's not like we won, but it was a victory in the sense. And then they came back and decided they were going to try us individually. And so once we knew that, we had to sign up on our name, one through 48, about where we would want to be tried at. I mean, what number, where would we want to be? And then, you know, Mavis was tried first and guilty. But by the time her trial came about, we had already planned the second occupation. And so there were more people signed up to get arrested then. I think that number had climbed up to over 100. And so our support group had multiplied, you know, to several hundred because, you know, so it, it was a little bit of a snowball and there were people that wanted, you know, once they knew that, I don't know, they just wanted to be part of it and all over Texas. And then in Oklahoma, there were folks that came down. Nice. And so it looked like, you know, the, the ball was rolling, but at the same time, we knew on the East coast where the bigger protests were going on, there were thousands of people in these occupations. And at the same time, we, we knew that we probably wouldn't get that many people in Texas, but you never knew, you know, you didn't know. So, uh, you know, it was always out there talking to people, doing handouts, uh, like the one little mini convention we talk, I talk about in the book Zoo World, one of the local radio stations had a little music festival kind of thing, and we recruited a lot of folks there. And that you know, ninety eight point seven, or <laughs> no, uh, no, uh, what was that? Uh, zoo, I can't kazoo. I can't remember what the call numbers. Yeah, were. I was trying to remember. I don't remember. But they were, pretty, you know, it, it was Zoo Fest. It was, it was good. But there was, you know, in, in recruiting like that, that's how we built support. You had a lot of one-on-one -on -one conversation with people. And there were questions. I, I remember it was, it was like two days of, of this, and th there were really no arguments. It was all face-to-face -face conversation of like, well, how, how are we going to generate power if we don't use this nuclear power? You know, that's when we started talking about alternative energies, you know, wind power, which is a big deal out in Texas now, mm -hmm. you know, biogas. Uh, you know, solar, things like that. So, you know, it was educate, agitate and organize, you know, kind of thing. Yeah. Even then, you know. Yeah, it's just like if that coalition and that and that attention to talking to the community, I mean, uh, about right. this and just engaging them, I think. Uh, yeah, they were all you shared was. Oh, yeah. Back to your early there. There were there was a group called the Armadillo Coalition in Texas, which is an umbrella group of all the different uh, different smaller groups around the state. And they would get together and, you know, 
talk about stuff, but they weren't really more, they weren't really into the direct action part of it. And that's one thing that, that how the Comanche Peak Life Force came to be because it was like, it felt like there was a time for more, you know, direct action. Let them know that we are serious about this. Let's go out there and cross the fence. And then we evolved into uh, smaller groups because, well, we, the affinity groups were already there. And the one, the group that I was involved in, in East Dallas, we were at this point, a bunch of really trusted friends. We had a community garden going on. We actually buy stuff, you know, do the co-op thing together. And we just decided, that, you know, let, let's see what, you know, let's rattle our cage a little bit, you know, let's, uh, let's go, you know, let's, let's just go shut the front gate, see what they do. It was that pretty much that spontaneous. And, you know, so we go, yeah, we can do this with, because at this time the plant was still being built. It was not an enclosed facility. I mean, you know, it's like 10,000 acres. This place is huge. And so the main gate, uh, they hadn't even, uh, they had, they were putting up a perimeter fence. And so we had done scouting runs and stuff like that and decided that, you know, I, I think we can get their attention, which we did. We did. <laughs> oh, yeah. And it was, you know, it, it was, uh, that was an adventure in itself too, you know. And, but, but back to the, coalition part of it they uh i don't know it's just people just you know didn't want to go out there and you know they didn't want to get arrested it's kind of like you know i'd rather sign a petition hopefully that'll help make some phone calls which you know yeah if you've done any of that at all it, you know sometimes you're just beating a dead horse yeah so yeah I think, I think moving into the kind of the the support and the direct actions in in the book and in, in the section where you're talking about Diablo Canyon, you had a an image of a document entitled "Conditions for Ending the Blockade," um, because the story, which you can expand on, but in general, there there was a there's a blockade that happened at Diablo Can Canyon, right. Um, and so I would like to invite you just to tell us about that story. And then specifically, um, was that, I'm curious to know, was that document an internal document, uh, like the agreements that those people do in the blockades for, or was it an external document to, to let people know these are what, what's going to, what we were requesting. Um, and this is what's going to end the, the demands. I be honest with you, that document came from the, the handbook for the blockade of Diablo Canyon mm -hmm. by that was put out by the Clamshell Alliance. No, it was Abalone, Clamshell. Which one was it? Abalone Alliance. Yeah, I think it, you mentioned Ablo, it. Like Clamshell is out on the East Coast. So, and, and it was just in their handbook, and that was another trademark of the of the uh, these occupations. The people that planned them would do uh, handbooks to where you know you could read through and, and find out this is what the plan is about. This is how the action will go, or this is what we'd like that action to go. Um, we went out to Diablo Canyon. It's just you know it's to show support, and we didn't have any plans for getting arrested out in California, you know. So I would say that was an internal document put on by the Abalone Alliance for all their, you know, people that had been involved in the ongoing occupations out there. Because uh, it was a bit of a uh, turnstile kind of action it seems like they're one of their goals other than stopping the plant was fill up the jails fill up the court system where the public has to make a decision do we want to keep doing this because these these folks are going to keep protesting you know is this plant worth having 
never, never mind. It's very close to, you know, a fault line yeah. and uh, things like that. So, so we went out, our, our small group from Texas went out as basically a support group yeah. and uh, hiked in and hung out above, you know, as, like it says in the book, hung out in the hills there, supporting the folks coming in, going down, getting arrested. A day later, you'd see those same people come in, <laughs> hike down, go in and get arrested. <laughs> and that's, you know, it's like, it was great. And at the same time, there were, you know, groups out, you know, I was, you know, I was Greenpeace or Sea Shepherd or somebody out, out in the water trying to do, an, you know, you know, water blockade. So it, it, it was, it was, uh, that was a lot of action. That was good. Yeah, it, it, just the, the stories and and the recap and the of everything in the book is it's just I, I I'm I'm still reading it I'm still going through it and rereading some things because it's just it's just really great to connect with this history and and talk to you um, about this I, I'm curious to like well, let's fast forward because fast forward to today um, and looking at you know the environmental crisis that that we're we're facing and seeing. Um, other coalitions, you know, of youth and 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 wide range uh, of people stepping up to take accountability for the future. Um, what do you what do you think about the actions that are going now? Do you do you see a lot of things that have changed in terms of of political policies, um, or do you see it maintaining the same and we're fighting? the same struggle what what is what, well, what is your I, take on it <laughs> I, I think we're fighting the strength the same struggle but the, the opposing forces have gotten smarter in the sense that they're passing more laws to to prohibit us from uh exercising our rights to mm -hmm. dissent and free speech and, and you know it's the same time as they're trying to limit voting rights of you know of, people of you know the eligible voters to be able to vote but that's it you know because i've noticed that you know uh all of a sudden now it's a felony in some places to block a road or to protest uh on the property of a utility company you know and you know kind of like the only way it used to be a felony like that if you were protesting or, or uh, on a nuclear i mean a, a weapons base or something a military base now it's gotten to be next door if you will it's like okay you really got to do your legal homework and understand what the ramifications are of your actions if you're going to do this as a group if you're going to do it as an individual, you know, that's different, you know. Uh, well, you still got to be, you know, know what your, what the, you know, your responsibilities are and what the, you know, what your actions may bring, you know. If you're, if you're ready to go to jail or something like that, if you're just going to do a little hit and run, uh, that's one thing, you know. So yeah. that's kind of, that's my take on it. I mean, we definitely, there the pollution issue around us here in, in Mississippi is so bad. I mean, is the single use plastic is everywhere. I mean, I've been involved in uh, four major river cleanups and we have one coming up in September and it is just unbelievable how much trash is out there that is not decomposing. Back in, the, you know, like 70s, early 80s, the big deal was bottle bills, people getting them to put, uh, deposits on glass bottles we you, you, you know those are gone this is what we have now is plastic yeah and you know and, and like around the rivers and stuff it's the monofilament line the big fishing nets on the coast you know from the truck you know long line trawlers and stuff like that uh goodness knows about the you know the uh dead zone in the gulf or the big garbage mats out in the, in the ocean so it, it's Everybody needs to be doing something. Yeah. Just sitting back thinking about retirement is, is a, for what? I mean, if, you know, if we don't have clean air, water, you know, to breathe and trees and stuff like that, I mean, what's, what, what are you going to retire to? Yeah. You know, so, I mean, that's, that's kind of where I'm at now is more of the, you know, environmental 
this is what I can do. We got a we got a garden, like life depends on it, which it does. And, Absolutely. You know, and and, and I, there are folks, folks out there that are, have got some good books out, and and you know, and 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 saying this is how you can do this. I mean, there's you know, if you're if you're beyond, you know, you shouldn't be beyond taking a book and looking at it and going, okay, well that's a good idea. Make it my own. Do it, do it your way. And, and, you know, you can use my book like that a, a little bit. It's not meant to be a guide. It's just basically like I started it out to be is like, you know, this is just what happened. This, this, this is a story you make out of it what you want. I'm not trying to convince you that this is good. This is bad. This is the way it should be. It's just like, OK, this is what happened. Honest engine, you know, kind of thing. Yeah. And, and so uh, I, I just really think anybody that has any sense that think that feels like they care about their community their state their country the planet needs to be involved you know you have to think globally but be active locally you know you know plant a garden even if it's a tomato in a five gallon bucket you know so, yeah. so, I think I think uh, I, I like that you bring bring forward. You know, like act locally, like plant plant your garden. You know, start start building that that infrastructure that's needed to take care of the community. I think that speaks loudly to the stories that you just shared about building a co coalition and uh, being in communication, being there to support each other. I guess like because that's the that's the way that we pave to the new world and exactly from this one. And I, I find just in my experience, I'm going to project a bit that, that sometimes we get stuck in one and, and not do the other. And the other would mean actually, we actually also have to remove what oppresses us. And in this case, it would be the corporations who are producing the plastic, who are polluting the water with oil and stuff. They need um, to be responsible for their actions, just like you and I have to be. Absolutely. And so um, in, in your, in your experience, you know, with, with these actions and with the Texas anti-nuke work, um, how did that play out of, of holding corporations and and institutions accountable for their actions in this how did that i don't think it's necessarily paid out in a good way and even though there's a lot more what we call alternative energies or renewable energies is more the word for it the wind farms the big solar farms uh and and, and things like that but these corporations the the energy people it, it's still about the money there, you know, it's all about making the money because the nuclear industry was and probably still is subsidized greatly by, you know, the government in whatever form that might be. So, and I know over here, the big power company, they're all hooked up to the grid. I heard, I know out in Texas, you hear about the grid this and the grid that, you know, it went down in the freeze in September, I mean, in February, because they didn't winterize. Just like if you don't winterize your home, you're going to have issues if it gets cold. They invest in renewable energies because they get tax breaks to do it. They're not so much really serious about making a difference. So I'm hoping with the new political climate, be it hopefully long lived, that we can turn the page and start doing being more decentralized about our energy sources instead of having to depend on the grid all the time even though you're using renewable resources or energy sources the grid goes down you, you, your lights go off so the decentralization of a lot of things just like as a kid we used to grow a lot of what we eat now most people, I mean, I, we still grow some stuff, but I, I'd be lying if I said I grow a lot of it. I, we grow some things, but we still go to the grocery store to get stuff. But I try to go to the local farmer's market and get local produce. Like, that's what, I, that's what I'm going to do tomorrow on Saturday. You can go buy some more fruit trees to plant this fall. You know, that kind of thing. So I, I, I don't know. I, I'm, I'm optimistic for us. But for his corporate, you know, military industrial complex, I don't know. 
I, it's still out there and it's still eating the world. Yeah. yeah. And, you know, I mean, all we can do is, you know, stand our ground. And if you get tired of doing that, you know, that vac, you know, you know, you stood, it's a vacuum and it's going to be filled by greed. You know, that's the whole thing. It's not to me. I mean, it's not the dollar. It's the greed of more dollars and whatever it, whatever cost is one of the main problems, you know, I mean, uh, just, you know, just like, you know, we, you know, we've got to have some source of currency. It's like, I have to be able to get to work. I have to have a vehicle, you know, so. I know that might be muddy and a, muddy enough a little <laughs> bit what you were saying, but you know. No, I mean it's 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 the system that we live in, and we yes. we're, we're in a quest for a, a better system. So we right. have to take advantage of. We have no other option at this point. <laughs> right. Yeah. So. Yeah. Exactly. I mean, uh, and and one thing, looking back, what early on. They were talking about auto, you know, auto emissions or more gas mileage. And, you know, when cars, were, they're going to make a law that cars had to give 35, 40 miles per gallon, you know. And then, then when that day would get close, they'd just push it back, push it yeah. back, push it back. And, you know, here we are. You know, you're not five anymore and it's not 1970, <laughs> you know, but, you know, but it's uh, you know, we all do what we can. You know, it's just like, you know, me being a professional, I'm a gardener now. You know, but it's a great platform because people expect me to be a tree hugger. Well, yeah, I was a tree hugger. I was an arborist. Yeah, you know, that kind of thing. So it opens the door for conversation. You know, I mean, um, my my current job, I take care of a 20-acre property for a, 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 comp a large Mississippi company. It's a road building company. But they're all about new infrastructure because that's just, you know, that's part of where we're headed as a society if we're going to, you know, continue. So I'm optimistic that, you know, it's going to be okay. But we, you know, you can't just assume it's going to be. Everybody's got to take some action. Absolutely. Yep. And I appreciate what you're doing. I, I think this is golden, Jason. Well, well thank you. Thank you. And I'll, I deeply want to thank you for, you know, the, use the phrase that you just used is open the door to communication. Um, I'm in conversation. I'm, I'm happy you opened the door to us so we can learn about you um, and learn about who you are as a person, learn about the, the work and the, the critical work that you've done to help open the doors for others to see um, that there are paths to a different world and different, a uh, different way of being. So I want to thank you for that. And then I want to let people listening and watching this know that you can actually get this book um, that Jerry, let me put my camera on so you can see it, that Jerry wrote, Buttons, Bolt, bolt Cutters, and Barricades on his website, which is yes. Jerry, jerrypalmerauthor.com. And you can also get it on a Radical Guide. And if you want to buy directly from Jerry, um, please do so. Again. His website, there, which I'll put here. Um, yeah, there's that. There's now a hard copy version available, library yes. material. Yes, so I recommend everyone grabbing it because it's just, just the the for the simple fact of just knowing our history, knowing what people went through, learning from that, and connecting with that is is so critical for us to continue to pull this thread of liberation that is deeply needed today. So again, thank you so much, Jerry, for spending time with us. Um, I hope we can stay in conversation beyond this and, and maybe collaborate on something in the future. Yes, my pleasure. Thank you, Jason. Thank you.